welcome everyone to the inaugural Paul Priday Lecture. Uh, my name is Kane Race. I'm Chair of the Department of Gender and Cultural Studies, and I'll be facilitating uh, tonight's event. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognising their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. I pay my respect to their elders past and present. We're hosting tonight's event from the lands of the Gadigal of the Aora Nation. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the various lands on which people are tuning in from this evening and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be attending this event, whether in person or online. So it's a real pleasure to be introducing the Paul Priday Lecture Series in Gender and Cultural Studies, which is being held tonight for the first time here in the Chowchak Wing Museum at the University of Sydney. This lecture series is made possible by a donation from Carrot, a leading global media agency with whom Dr. Paul Priday and Professor Elspeth Proben collaborated in 2014 and 15 to introduce uh, the CARAT employees to research and thinking from the fields of gender and cultural studies. Paul graduated as a doctor of gender and cultural studies in 2016, shortly before his premature death. In this series and in memory of Paul, we plan to host several annual lectures with leading scholars in the fields of gender and cultural studies and consumption writ large. Paul undertook his PhD in the Department of Gender and Cultural Studies after many years experience as a talented creative across a range of leading advertising agencies. He came to the department with an interest in exploring why women rarely featured in the top ranks of creative personnel in the advertising industry. And he conducted a multi-sided ethnography in three multinational ad agencies in Sydney, Delhi and Shanghai under the supervision of Professor Elspeth Proben, our speaker for this evening. Paul's uh, PhD thesis, Obsessions with Brilliance, Masculinities and Creativity in Transnational Advertising Agencies, explored how the hierarchical men's club of creative departments sanctions masculine privilege while collapsing traditional notions of class. Paul was a really highly valued member of the GCS community, and we are honoured to be joined tonight by members of his family, Margot Priday, Priday sorry, and Polly Priday. In memory of Paul, I've asked a peer and close friend of Paul's time with us in the Department of Gender and Cultural Studies to say a few words. Uh, Dr. Karen Drysdale is a research fellow at the Center for Social Research and Health and the Community Partnerships Fellow at the Health Equity Research and Development Unit, both of which are academic appointments at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. Karen completed her PhD at the Department of Gender and Cultural Studies at about the same time as Paul, uh, and now conducts research with marginalised and vulnerable communities concerning their health and well-being. Thanks, Karen. Welcome. Hello, everyone. It's been three years, 10 months and 15 days since this great man, Dr. Paul Priday, died prematurely after a brutal bout of illness. And I've been tasked with providing some context to this lecture to remind those of us who knew him of our enduring loss and to introduce those new to Paul to convey something of his significance and of his legacy to the Department of Gender and Cultural Studies. There is no time to adequately list his many accomplishments. They span the advertising industry, the business school, gender and cultural studies and beyond. So instead, I wanna take this time to tell you about the man I viewed as friend and to share with you his great humanity and humility and his strong commitment to and practice of gender equality. So as um, Kane just mentioned, Paul and I commenced our PhDs within a few months of each other. Me, a mature age candidate, and he, a very mature age candidate. So we had that in common. But I was curious, and I watched him closely, this new colleague of mine. I saw how he volunteered for the sorts of roles that generate more work than prestige. I noticed his congeniality, openness, and generosity to everybody with whom he came in contact. And I registered his close involvement in the department doings, both in program and course development, but also in those industry relationships and linkages that the university needs so desperately to maintain its significance in this world. Over the years, we touched base in various corridors and at various conferences, and indeed at the numerous social events and informal institutional mentorships 
that foster such a supporting environment for HDR students here at GCS. It was through those various fora that I learned that Paul is indeed a very important person in the advertising world who then gifted UCID Business School with his acumen and insight. And I, coming from my two degrees at the time of gender studies within this department, and he began, uh, sorry, and he began to talk about gender equity, about its translation into the various domains of life in which we had our individual expertise. And I very much valued his commitment to gender equitable practice. He certainly walked the talk. And his thesis on the gendered power dynamics in the advertising industry is a revelation, meticulously researched, expertly presented, and beautiful in its careful exposition of how gender pervades our everyday and commercial contexts. So we became close as our submission dates dovetailed, and we increasingly relied on each other um, for the type of insight and motivation that is so desperately needed when you're about to submit a thesis. It was at one of our regular catch-ups that he told me about his cancer diagnosis and prognosis. Despite the devastation of this news, it was so important to him to finish his thesis. And I can only imagine the strength of will that it took for him to do at that stage. We submitted our theses within a couple of months of each other and it became clear that his degree to conferral had to take place sooner rather than later. And so rather than graduating with the scheduled Faculty of Arts and Social Science graduates, we were slotted in early with a largely business school graduate program, of which I only now appreciate the irony of this uncanny evidence of his intersecting achievements. Our degrees were conferred on one ridiculously hot and humid day in December 2016. As we sat together in that hot hall, he told me about how proud he was of us and ever thoughtful he'd even matched his necktie to suit my dress. But what will be an enduring memory for me was the moment when us newly minted PhDs were asked to stand and the academic procession doffed their hats, a timeless ritual that welcomes us into the academy. Oh, Paul leaned into me to say, oh, I like that. <laughs> He appreciated the gesture for what it was, the ritual acknowledgement that he, having achieved this last accomplishment, was now formally account, uh, counted among his peers. So along with his substantial legacy in the advertising and higher education sector, he leaves his wife, Margot, and daughter, Polly, both impressive, independent, and successful women. And now his granddaughter, Esther, who is here to make her stamp on the world that her grandfather was so instrumental in bettering and so it is with this brief introduction that I pay homage to the person to whom this lecture is devoted. Amid the celebration of his scholarly greatness, I want to remind you all that he was simply, absolutely an excellent human being and one of the greatest I've ever known. So for Paul, I am forever your friend, one of your greatest admirers, and I miss you every day. Thank you, Karen. I'd now like to introduce our speaker for tonight, Professor Elspeth Proben. Elspeth is well known as a pioneering figure in gender and cultural studies in Australia and internationally. She's a fellow of the Australian Academy of the Humanities and the Australian Academy of the Social Sciences. Her work has modeled inspiring new ways of working with feminist, cultural and social theory and doing cultural studies. Elspeth undertook her PhD in communication at Concordia University in Montreal and worked in sociology at the University of Montreal before coming to the University of Sydney to head the Department of Gender Studies in 1996. She is known, she is the author of numerous groundbreaking monographs, most recently uh, Eating the Ocean, and over 100 articles and chapters across the field of gender and cultural studies, sociology, media, cultural geography, anthropology, critical psychology and philosophy, as well as an editor of several uh, edited collections. Professor Proben's work demonstrates her extraordinary range, breadth and curiosity as a thinker. She has written on topics as diverse as gender and sexuality, cultural studies of food, affect, emotion and embodiment, human ocean entanglements, 
sustainability and the politics of production and consumption. Her research has played a really significant role in establishing several new areas of scholarship from embodied research methods to cultural studies of food to affect studies. Across these diverse topics and concerns, Elspeth is well known for her capacity to bring in intellectual concepts to life by connecting them with everyday realities. Her work is characterized by its distinctive style, humor and wit, but above all, its capacity to create connections across diverse realities and its remarkably generous intellectual and political ethic. It is, I think, the imaginative power of Elspeth's work that inspired many of us to engage in academic vocations, to believe that intellectual work could be a meaningful way of articulating our cares and concerns. And on this point, the point of uh, Elspeth's extraordinary imaginative uh, capacity in her work, I'd like to quote from Elspeth's book, 1993 book, Sexing the Self, where she writes, Central to tracing the possibilities of the self is that pull of imagination which throws me into imaging other articulations of how we might be caught up in each other. In order to realize the self as a limit attitude where we work at the very edges and ends of ourselves in order to envision change, we must engage our imaginations more fully. I think this passage gives us a really important insight into Elspeth's approach and her inestimable capacity to uh, launch the self on new adventures in thinking and to bring others along with her. We're all really looking forward to learning from Elspeth as she turns her imagination and critical attention to the question of doing cultural studies in rough seas, the COVID-19 ocean multiple. So let me welcome to the stage, Professor Elspeth Croven. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, I too want to acknowledge that we are on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, and I also want to thank uh, the professional staff from Sophie, as well as Kane and Ruth, um, and the Chad Chak Wing for um, dedicating, dedicating, <laughs> giving us this venue free. Ooh. Um, I too want to acknowledge, um, thankfully, that Polly and Ma uh, Margo are here, and we'll raise a glass um, afterwards at the drinks. So, um, now this paper, um, and Peter, how do I share the screen again? Oh, you are a bloody amazing person. <laughs> Right, great. So now I just do. Okay. Uh, this is part of a, I guess it's a book project on uh, the ocean multiple. And I can talk later about why it is important to start thinking about that multiplicity um, in terms of politics, geopolitics, etc. The image I chose for this, for the poster for this event is of Jean Pilmont's seascape from the late 1780s. Pinamont was more famous for his rather tame chinoiserie. However, towards the end of his life, he turned to violent maritime subjects, storms at seas, ships wrecked, passengers and goods cast violently by the motion of the waves on rocky shores. According to Catherine Mitchell, they exhibit an atmosphere of fear, must always reflect the depth of anxiety and uncertainty felt throughout Western Europe during the early stages of the French Revolution and terror. I could equally have used this image from John uh, J. M. W. Turner's painting of the slave ship, the Zong, from 1840. Here it is the pall of slavery and the fear of the slaves of whom 132 were thrown overboard so that the owners could collect the insurance that permeates my engagement with the ocean. Um, and it is more explicitly the focus of the paper I'm working on now. But I do want to thank Fiona all those years ago for pointing out that insurance came from the slave trade. Um, excuse me. With this present paper, it's with a different um, atmosphere of fear that I turn to an account of our times. 
<coughs> excuse me, this is an intensely local paper <coughs> in accord with Ju uh, Ruth and Jess's pro provocation. I must say at the outset, I hope not to just rehearse past events with which we're all too familiar, but to account for movements, as in Pinemont's title for this, Tempête, Naufrage d'un bateau, Vague des hommes. I offer here a reckoning of political affective storms, wrecks, waves, and the more than human. And I gesture to the ways in which the COVID ocean throws up starkly the problems of globalization, especially in terms of the ways in which we are all connected through supply chains. Trying to do cultural studies in lockdown. Trying to do anything in lockdown is hard. Trying to think and plan for the ne even the near future is tough, but necessary if we are to keep on going on. There is a careful balancing act between using analytical skills to understand the present conjuncture in which we find ourselves differentially and rushing to pronounce from on high about it. In April 2020, Warwick Anderson noted the ways in which Within weeks of its emergence, SARS-CoV-2 was galvanizing celebrity European philosophers and social theorists, most of them men in a vulnerable, vulnerable age demographic, to reflect publicly and plentifully on the meaning of the pandemic. He concluded that in the haste to manufacture mental personal protective equipment against the corona scene, it is all too easy to make mistakes to mass produce fatuity, guesswork, and irrelevance. Um, and I should say that I had trouble with the, the tenses because I wrote this um, oh, about six months ago, um, or kind of during the, the whole COVID. So you, please forgive me for those sort of temporal shifts. It depends on what cultural studies <clears throat> project one is trying to do in lockdown. For many years in my own practice, I tended to use conceptual framings to understand various everyday conjunctures of sexuality and gender. It's feasible that had I continued in this vein, I could have gone on doing a certain form of cultural studies. Um, however, years ago, several years ago, I veered towards a more grounded form of cultural studies that needs solid ethnographic basis in and from which to think. And thus, it was at the beginning of 2020 that I found myself with a new project funded by the ARC. Um, and the project would, will, maybe will, push my ethnographic involvement further in requiring field work at fish markets in Manila and Dakar and Senegal, as well as here in Sydney. Before I could even think about organizing it, our university and the world shut down. So in lieu of actually observing people's practices and talking to them, I find myself back to texts. In this paper, I want to use manifestations of the ocean to think through a conjunctural analysis of the human marine and, and what it might look like. What might it add to cultural studies? Is there a place in the ocean? Or is there a place for the ocean in cultural studies? I don't know if there is a place in the ocean. <laughs> Um, and what might a non-terrestrial perspective contribute? In her recent book on wild policy, our colleague Tess Lee argues that familiar tools of scrutiny can blind us to what might also be there, hidden in plain sight if we care to look askance. The ocean has not been a familiar object of scrutiny in cultural studies, notwithstanding Steve Metz's nomenclature of blue cultural studies, and Metz's fascinating project is the poetic history of the sea. However, my project involves using familiar concepts in cultural studies while looking askance at the ocean's own materiality and at its material engagement in human and non-human life. A perspective whereby the methodological is inseparable from the epistemological guides my thinking and my turn to the ocean fisheries and fish over the last several years. Of the necessity, this move exceeds the discursive, even while it attends to the material effects 
of colonial history, international law, and particular systems which bind humans and the marine. The ocean is fundamental as a means of communication. Think, for instance, that ocean-going cargo ships still transport something like over 90 to 99% of our global, of our consumer goods, and that since the 1850s, 300 cable systems cover 550,000 miles of the seafloor. In these and many other ways, the, the ocean is a lively and fluid medium that connects the human and the more than human. As one of the last and thoroughly vexed commons, and as a medium itself, the ocean is central to modes of transmitting, sharing, and as Williams would say, making common to many. If the ocean is cultural, it is most certainly economic. Geographer Philip Steinberg writes that the history of the modern world economy can be read as a history of the simultaneously, simultaneous opening and closing of the ocean frontier. Uh, Steinberg's work with Kevinley, uh, Kimberly Peters considers the ocean's three-dimensional and turbul turbulent materiality in what they call um, a wet ontology. Um, however, despite the kind of high theorizing, I've come to see there's a lot of proprietorial, disciplinary proprietorial uh, grabbing, ocean grabbing going on. Um, there, um, However, in their theorizing, the sea is often devoid of life traces. In more bluntly political terms, economic geographers Elizabeth Havis and Anna Zalik argue that the narrative of an empty sea uh, has deliberately excluded human activity in it, notably the transatlantic slave trade and black history. In this way, it echoes the critiques of Turner at the time of Turner's The Slave Ship that saw its focus on the aesthetics of the painting, not the reality of the slave trade. How can an explicitly cultural studies understanding of the ocean uh, come to understand how it communicates forms and informs? Anyone trained in cultural studies in Canada, not a lot of us, uh, or touched by the work of John Carey, more, will know of Harold Innes's insistence on the history and economics of communication as the movement of people and ideas and things, most notably expressed in the cod fisheries, the history of an international economy. For Innes, staples shape societies in a profound way. They allowed, to paraphrase again Williams, whole ways of life. As Herbert Heaton wrote in a review shortly after the publication of um, the 1940, The Cod Fisheries, Innes fundamentally changed Western notions about the ocean's movement, presenting, for instance, the Atlantic as a network of waterways uniting two sides, four continents, and six regions of an international and international intercontinental economy. As he continues, put those six points, Newfoundland, New England, the Maritimes, West Indies, West Africa, Western continental Europe, and the British Isles on a blackboard, and then trace out all the possible journeys of ships and transfers of goods, direct, triangular, quadrilangular, or hexagonal, and note the part the fish cargoes play. As Heaton emphasizes, Innes neglected no approach, economic, political, technological, geographical, historical, or etiological, and tries to reveal the interplay of factors changing or constant. In our time of fast scholarship, the breadth of Innes's at times idiosyncratic scholarship is hard to find in cultural studies or indeed anywhere. However, as Megan Morris, herself a proudly slow scholar, I hope I can say, recently argued, it is precisely the thick medium of cultural studies work and the complexity of the problems that confront us. This is, I think, especially important in these dizzying times. Morris's point here and across much of her career is to focus on what she calls the arts of making things happen and cultural 
study's potential in helping this process along. On her way to demonstrating this via Kung Fu, she's stopped by two images by the artist Don Moore of the reality and the imagined future of the seemingly endless construction of the Sydney light rail. This project began in 2014. Um, and at the time of writing those trams, of course, actual trams were ripped out in 1961, now whiz along empty of passengers who are confused about the differing messages about the safety of public transport. For Morris, part of the tragicomic tale of the delays in the completion of the project is due to the fact that before, and I quote, an old tarmac is lifted, nobody really has a clue what's underneath there or how the historical layered utility systems, which might or might not have been mapped, are tangled together with tree roots and unpredictably intersect. From this muddy image, Morris questions, how do all the material forces at work in a situation, environmental, political, social, economic, as well as what we decide to call cultural, connect and affect each other? What disparate sites do they come from? What changes do they mark? What traces of history do they carry? Where are they heading beyond those boundaries? Making things happen requires this kind of site-specific thinking and this necessity to work in the mud distinguishes cultural studies from the clean lines, big vistas, and glossy visions of cultural studies with which, she says, our field is sometimes confused. In what follows, I describe three muddy sites, a beach, a ship, and a fish market, to ask what they can tell us about the conjuncture of COVID-19. Looking at the present from the Athwat position of the human marine may shake up common sense notions about the terrestrial as a ground of cultural change. In moving cultural studies away from its own blind spots to, and to re-energize the desire to make things happen. Botany Bay. In late March, the weather was still, late March 2020, the, wind, the weather had, was still warm and the ocean balmy. The summer of 2019 and 2020 had been a doozy. As we will all perhaps always remember, bushfires have raged for months, creating some of the most polluted air and killing God knows how many natural um, species. However, it was under clear skies and feeling momentarily buoyed. Maybe the crisis wouldn't be that bad. I went swimming in Botany Bay more properly known as Kame in the Darawal language. One of the reasons we were at Botany Bay was that across the city at Bondi Beach, the warm weather had resulted in huge crowds. On the 21st of March, it was like New Year's Day weather-wise, 36 degrees, and crowd-wise, with thousands blanketing the sand. Uh, social distancing disappeared as beer and sunscreen and the smell of coconut oil blended and bonded people's bodies. The councils immediately closed all the beaches of the eastern suburbs as the affluent area became one of the hotspots for the transmission of the virus. Wealthy residents had gone skiing in Aspen. They returned from swanky snow resorts and mixed with the overseas backpackers, who are, of course, always also were a large part of that population, a perfect cocktail for virus transmission. So there we were on the other side of Sydney, getting away from the Petri dish of Bondi on the beach infamous for being Cook's first arrival spot on the 29th of April, 1770. Cook was struck by the number of stingrays and it was first named Stingray Bay, then renamed again Botany Bay because of plant specimens collected by the botanists aboard. In his journal, Cook recalls that uh, Quote, his landing party encountered two men and that a rock that was thrown by one of the men. He then goes on to describe the firing of a wandering shot, followed by two other shots, noting one man was wounded. As Dr. Shane T. Williams, an indigenous scholar and cultural consultant writes, 
Cook saw a group of two Grigal men who were assiduously carrying out their spiritual duty to country by protecting country from the presence of persons not authorized or welcome to be there. In our cultures, he says, it is not permissible. Uh, as the descendants of two grandmothers who proud our wild women, Williams thinks back to that moment of contact with Cook and his, the saltwater peoples of Camay. It was on Guigal country that Captain Cook and his um, landing party first encountered. Uh, two, 2020 marked the 250 years since Cook's arrival, but because of the mounting sense of crisis, the elaborate celebrations for the sisters sister centennial were muted. The event had been tagged by various government bodies as the view from the ship and the view from the shore. However, as Maria Nugent cogently argues, it's pretty wrong-headed. It suggests that each party remained and can remain still suspended in their own separate worlds on the ship or on the shore. That first contact initiated the devastation to indigenous populations that continues 251 years later, even as the celebration of Cook was overtaken by COVID-19. The coincidence didn't go unremarked. On the 30th of April, 2020, Victoria's Deputy Chief Health Officer, Annalise Van Diemen, published a post on her personal Twitter. Noting this coincidence, she says, sudden arrival of an invader from another land, decimating populations, creating terror, forces the population to make enormous sacrifices and completely change how they live in order to survive. COVID-19 or COVID-1770? Your comments unleashed fury that um, this was cultural wars during a pandemic. And of course, the arrival of Europeans brought immense death and suffering to indigenous people. As Tessie argues, the point though is not the arrival, but how that moment reverberates through social policy and other policies and everyday practices that continue to haunt. She cites Eve Tucker and Kay Wayne, Wayne Yang's crucial observation. The disruption of indigenous relationships to land represents a profound epistemic ontological cosmological violence. This violence is not temporarily contained in the arrival of the settler, but is reasserted each day of occupation. Back on the beach, they, that warm day, the water looked clear and inviting. Usually it's a bit murky not only with history, but with the pollution from infrastructure that's central to global and regional trade. Botany, as we know, is home to Sydney Kingsford Smith Airport, the longest running airport in the world since its inception, inception in 1920. However, that day, the skies were empty of planes. When I wrote this, it was very quiet. Australia was then the first country which would which would not let its citizens leave. Next to the ever sprawling airport, the cargo container precinct, Port Botany, was established in the 17, 1970s. There didn't seem to be much movement there, but later I heard that um, one of the largest container ships um, stopped by at 980 feet and as high as a 15 story building. Uh, it is owned the Ural, named after the mountains in Russia, is owned by China International Marine Containers Group, based in Shenzhen, China, and flies under the flag of Malta. As Brett Nielsen and Ned Rossiter write, the conditions of work at sea are caught in a game of evasion and control. Evasion and control also seem to sum up the history and presence present of Botany Bay. The world keeps coming to us, Commodities come and go, as do COVID masks, gloves, test kits, washed up on shores around the world. Contaminated waste is burned, and the toxins seep deep into the ocean to be carried by currents around the world. 
beaches may have been closed to humans, but our bodies and environments are porous to the toxic realities of the COVID-19 world. A ship called Ruby. After the fiasco of the British registered Diamond Princess, which was quarantined at Yokohama uh, from the 4th of February for about a month and resulted in the deaths of 14 people, on the 8th and 9th of March, the Ruby Princess embarked from Sydney on a cruise to New Zealand. The ship carried 2,700 passengers who had not been quarantined. On the 14th of March, the Australian government ordered that everyone arriving into Australia, including cruise passengers, needed to self-isolate for 14 days. The following day, the government announced the closing of ports. By that time, the Ruby Princess was in Wellington and, announced, and quickly made her way back to Sydney. On the 19th of March, the ship slunk into Sydney Harbour in the early morning. Ships do not like to come into Sydney at the early morning. That's not when you see the whole shebang. Um, with over 600 infected people on board, passengers disembarked, although there were no tests from the very few swab tests conducted. Amy Dale writes that the cruise cluster, which uh, is believed to have originated from an infected crew member, was responsible for at least 20 deaths. That's 20 of the overall 900 and something deaths recorded in Australia came from one ship. While different levels of government, state, commonwealth and assorted agencies all passed the buck, the princess, the Ruby Princess was shunt shunted off to Port Kembla on the 19th of March. And I think this slide makes it look like she's going the wrong way, but never mind. One, one says that she's going to Port Kembla. Um, after 14 days of quarantine, most of the passengers boarded flights to their home destinations. However, the majority of the crew remained. In the news at the time, the attention was uh, mainly on the passengers, but it was the plight of the crew that was much more horrific. Unpaid, squashed in inner cabins and sick, they were invisible victims. As one crew member put it, um, some nationalities like myself were left totally in the dark. We have to stay on board and the company has not even told us when we're sailing. New South Wales Police Commissioner Mick Fuller had a stern message to all cruise ship operators. They don't pay taxes in Australia. They don't park their boats in Australia. Time to go home. Right, but the question of home is tricky because of the complicated system of vessel flags, especially the open registry versus closed registry. Under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, uh, the latter represents a genuine link between the ship and the flag under which it sails, and the former, which is more often called flags of convenience. Uh, as set out under Article 90 of the 1982 UNCLO, Every state with a coast or a landlock has the right to sail um, ships under its flag. Um, this sometimes leads to totally irrational things. It may be uh, that a ship has no physical connection with its flag. Whoops, uh, no physical connection, no, um, which may never visit its notional home port or even find it possible to do so because Many of these flags of convenience come from landlocked countries, such as Mongolia or Bolivia. This leads to a strange situation whereby the regulation of the ship is under the exclusive jurisdiction of the flag state, which may have no means, e.g. access to the seas, or interest to exercise any control. Um, it also allows, as Higgins Dispose says, cruise companies to choose to use a flag of convenience as part of their economic model, um, helping them to gain business profit by avoiding stringent economic, social and environmental regulations. At the end of 2020, at the end of April 2020, it was reported that around the world, more than 100,000 crew workers were still trapped on cruise ships 
but there's over half a million of cargo uh, seafarers that were also tracked. Um, this is a haunting reality of stranded boats and people rebuffed from port to port and tangle of law based land based laws that allows landlocked or extremely poor countries to sell cheap flags with little regulatory interference for ships with underpaid crew, mostly from the global south. There's a distinct pecking order uh, ruled by class and gender and, and ethnicity, you won't be not gender because they tend to be masculine. Um, as Naur Ben Yehuda notes, one's social worth was tied to one's ability to get off the ship. Captain and owner could leave. The rest of us were stuck for the duration, serving a life sentence, as one of the crew called it. In terms of their floating so-called homes, the officers, mostly from the global north, are on top and the crew, mostly from Global South, are down at the bottom, down at the fish market. As is well known, people recognize this that go to the fish market. Yeah. As is well known, on the 1st of January 2020, Chinese authorities closed down a wet market in Wuhan, which may or may not have been the spark that lit the corona's fires. It was so, somewhat overlooked that it was a seafood market. Hunan seafood market sold wildlife, and along with live seafood, chickens, donkeys, sheep, pigs, foxes, badgers, bamboo, rats, hedgehogs, and snakes. Images of caged animals were splashed across newspapers across the world, and debate raged about whether or not the market was responsible. We know that wet markets sometimes have clothing responsible, or the place where zoonotic diseases leap between and amongst humans and non-humans. But to Western, for Western view, readers, these images were framed to trigger disgust. However, as Christos Linteris and Lynn Freely argue, shutting down Chinese wet markets would have been a terrible mistake and would send the mainly small producers of these animals onto the unregulated black market. Their argument raises complex debates about how these images communicate a sense of disgust towards the eating habits of the Chinese, and at the same time, they argue, reflect a fear of the interconnectedness of two types of emergence in China, viral emergence and economic emergence. Published in uh, the 31st of January, 2020, their argument about the intertwined fear of the virus and China's economic power were prescient. As we know, the tariff wars that China released on um, Australia uh, didn't happen until the 19th of April, uh, when our Prime Minister rather um, trod in it, to put it scientifically. Uh, that there have been racist attacks, oh, yes, and um, also they, of course, you'll remember that. Um, the uh, Chinese foreign ministry spokesman uh, said that it wasn't a good idea for um, Australian, uh, for citizens to travel to Australia for education or tourism because of the radical discrimination against Chinese. Now that there have been racist attacks against Chinese in Australia is undeniable um, and goes without saying the recent ones thrown up with by COVID-19 rest upon centuries of white Australian racism against Chinese and Asian Australians. Friends, students, and colleagues have been shaken and hurt by the blatant racist abuse that confronts them on the street if they look Chinese. The effects of COVID-19 on seafood have been little remarked upon outside of the copious fishery sites I read. <laughs> Seafood is a delicate commodity, always rendered precarious by the dependence on the state of the seas and by the markets that connect fish, fisher and consumer. I visited and continue to visit the Sydney fish market, the second largest in the world by species, uh, throughout the crisis. I wander through empty halls where once buses filled with mainland Chinese tourists jostled to find a park 
The pelicans were somber, no fish and chips to scavenge from tourists and consumers. On the 4th of February 2020, China put a halt to the live animal trade under coronavirus fears and individual sectors of the um, industry were and continue to be differentially hit. The high value ones immediately suffered because those are the ones we export. Uh, the rock lobster industry exports 90%, 95% of its stock to China, is devastated. Most of Queensland's live coral trout market, 99%, normally banned for China, came to a screeching halt. This handwritten sign at the empty entrance to the Sydney fish market touting a two-for-one abalone was a poignant sign of the times. Um, you all know how expensive abalone is. <laughs> Across the global south, the pandemic, um, and I quote here, has also locked down coastal fishing communities and seriously impacted livelihoods. Earnings have dropped because of lack of fish, market access, traditional credit sources, and clear government policy. This has particularly hit women fishers and fish workers as they're often not even recognized as such and therefore have not been entitled to receive government relief. Of the roughly 120 million people employed in the fisheries industry globally, more than 90% um, work in small scale fisheries and 97% live in the uh, global south. And women make up at least half of that workforce. During the pandemic, according to FAO, small fishing boats, fish markets and female workers were amongst the categories worst affected by the economic impact of the coronavirus crisis. Multinational industry, industrial fishing factories uh, were the least affected as they continued to strip the global south of fish. Following the geopolitics of broken supply chains and bodies and the devastation on uh, fishers and processes is part of my ongoing research. Uh, to suffice to say, it's a messy and awfully, often deadly state of affairs. And these are uh, women fish workers processing. Final section is called COVID conjunctures. These descriptions only scratch the surface of what is going on. Of course, within cultural studies to ask what's going on is to interrogate the conjuncture. In Lawrence Grossberg's elaboration of this concept method mode of analysis, uh, he states, a conjuncture is a description of a social formation as fractured and conflictual along multiple axes, planes and scales constantly in search of temporary balance or structural stabilities through a variety of practice and processes of struggle and negotiation. Yet a conjuncture has to be constructed, narrated and fabricated. In John Clark's understanding, the narrating and fabricating of a particular conjuncture can be, as he says, no more than a sketch since tracing the different dynamics and forces that come together to con constitute the con conjuncture is a substantial challenge. And one of the dangers of this form of slow documentation is that one can disappear into the minutia of detail, of international law of the seas, of human-made disasters that allowed passengers from the cruise ship to return to their homes across the world, while crew uh, and boats remained at the sea, of the multiple ways that show we are not all in this together. Uh, while the affirmative and negative phrasings of this statement abound, I wonder if there is a way of conjoining uh, effective solidarity and material difference. To return to uh, Morris's argument that I cited at the outset, we need site-specific thinking that locates the material forces at work in a situation. As Clark has argued, this brings to fore multiple temporalities, which are, as he says, central 
to this view of a conjuncture as a site in which they become condensed, entangled, and co-constitutive of a crisis. In the words of the author of Policing the Crisis, authors, uh, Stuart Hall et al., still one of the most exemplary conjectural accounts, the depth of the crises, in a sense, is to be seen in the accumulation of contradictions and breaks. To conclude, what do my descriptions of the oceanic COVID-19, painfully researched but still undercooked, add to a specifically cultural studies understanding of our present conjuncture? Writing in the time of the conjuncture, I've attempted to sketch how understanding the depths of the ocean's temporalities and spatialities deepens the breadth of cultural studies potential to grasp the uneven flows of the virus and of everyday life. Yes, certainly COVID-19 is about globalization, but in a very different key. I could have followed more deeply the ways in which colonization, the arrival of Cook, cruising, the catastrophe of the Ruby Princess, not to mention the catastrophe of of a weird business model, um, fishing, the upending of supply chains and livelihoods display the uneven movement of COVID-19. But I hope it's clear that the maritime enables what we inhabit today and the framing of the ocean's multiple reveals the eddies of specificities that make COVID-19 the manifestation of contradictions and breaks as well as continuity. That some are free to travel, others confined to stasis, whether it's crew on stateless ship or locked down in homes or rendered homeless, reveals one painful vector of material difference of this crisis. It's up to us to think across these stark differences about where effective solidarity might emerge. We are in rough seas, bound together and divided by how history haunts us in this painful present. And I hope to have provided at least one partial account of what our discipline might be able to do. Thank you. I remember when you first came to Australia. I don't remember when that was. And you came to my then home in Bandina on the 1989. beach. 1989, yeah. And there's Port Hacking with a deadly rip. And you got in the water and swam to New Zealand, as, <laughs> as we used to say. I, I do not think I grew up with Australian beachiness, which is all about like surfboards and clothing and nasty things coming out of the water. I don't think anyone I had ever met would dream of doing such a thing <laughs> on an alien beach, just heading for the horizon. There's a fearlessness. There was then already in your relationship uh, to the ocean and you give us uh, your intellectual biography sure there's a big shift away from sort of sexing the self and <clears throat> autobiographical issues but nevertheless when I hear you stimulate my own very resistant imagination towards thinking about the ocean I see that moment of terror <laughs> watching you swim um, you must have had a long-standing attachment. Could you um, say just a little <laughs> sure, bit about yeah, absolutely. that? Um, I, I remember that very well. It was lovely staying with Megan and Andre, and we went to the RSL, and um, one of the old blokes said, um, oh, it's okay, they only eat virgins. <laughs> um, yeah, um, you know, Growing up, um, or not just, um, I've been attracted to um, lots of different places to swim. And, um, you know, I was thrown into a huge lake by my mother when I was two. Um, but it was coming to Australia. I mean, I've, I used to swim out in Vancouver past the cargo ships. Um, and, you know, same in Mexico and everywhere else. But... Coming here, I learned to really respect and be in awe of the ocean. And I think really and truly that's probably what changed my, the seriousness, I suppose, with which I take these matters. Thank you. 
other questions or comments? Oh, Jennifer, you do need it. Yeah. Hi, Elspeth, thank you so much for a great paper. I'm really um, grateful specifically for you focusing so intensively on, on the colonial and reconfiguring or deeply um, situating um, whatever the ocean may or may not be conceptually, aesthetically within a colonial framework. Um, I think that's often lacking in, in um, how people are conceiving of the sea, not in your work, however. Um, historically, certainly not. So I'm interested then, I, I suppose, in asking you a little bit further to think about that around um, the kinds of otherwise far more ambiguous notions around um, liminality, literality, um, the ambiguous station, the fluidity of the sea and of water, particularly the aqueous and all those kind of much more querying kinds of capacities that you've brought to all of our sensibilities historically. I'm interested that, that colonialism kind of slams out a lot of that and why you might think that is the case. Mm -hmm. Politically, I can see the movement really clearly and, and I'm actually really appreciating it. Just wondering if I could hear what you think. Yeah. Um, I mean, if, if I'm taking you right, I mean, there, there has been um, a plethora of overuse, um, especially in talking about globalization, about fluidity and blah, blah, as if, as if there aren't any hard edges. And for me, those hard edges are provided by colonial and present histories and you know, actualities um, endured by, by the global south. I mean, we know that the, through the work of Paul Gilroy, that the, the Black Atlantic uh, is you know absolutely um, entrenched in one's um, intellectual imagination, but I mean I've been reading much more widely also about the forms of um, slavery that took place um, in the the um, uh, the Southeast Asian Peninsula um, and. Yes, absolutely. I mean, in terms of of the indigenous, um, you know, uh, the ignoring of the indigenous sea rights, uh, the connections to sea country um, in many countries, um, and also then in the industrial marine complex of of all of those hard, hard edges. Yeah, so um, I don't know, um, somehow I was still querying things with mermaids in eating the ocean. I can't really do that anymore. Other questions? Comments? Come on, students. <laughs> <laughs> also, yeah. just to um, the people in the Zoom room, um, if you'd like to put any questions in the um, chat, we will, we're monitoring that. I have a very small question, Elspeth. I, I know this project well, partly because I helped you with the ARC application. So it's actually a bit triggering for me to <laughs> see some of this content again after, you know, sitting on the weekend doing data entry. Um, uh, I was wondering, I'm, I'm always taken aback by that fact that, that these ocean workers are often women, that they're sort of 50% women. That, that statistic is so staggering to me. And it only made sense really when I saw the image of the women doing the kind of mm. line work. Um, could you talk to me more about the kind of gendered work? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Grace, and thanks for your help on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I corrected myself because there are very few women on board ships. Um, and that has to do with um, a deep and across many cultural uh, superstitions. Um, but the majority of processing, so everyone thinks of the, the, the fisher as the masculine um, individual, rugged, heroic, but the, the vast majority of the processing is done by women. And of course, it's not done by women in the global north. So, I mean, once you start following the, the uh, confusing supply chains of when you know, 
what is fished where and then taken to to where so for instance tuna you know it's fished in the maldives but then goes to thailand uh for processing um and then is shipped uh you know it's put on a john west and advertise it with a bear um but yeah it is it is a deeply deeply um gendered field and if ever um i get to manila my one of my pis um is probably the other queer fish person <laughs> i'm sure there's lots of others um but uh yeah kale um has worked about masculinities on board and i mean there must be um such rich materials about homosexuality and um homosexuality on board or men having sex with men um yeah i mean in eating the ocean i did find some gorgeous tales about the herring quines um who went to um, strip the herring following the the boats um and they went to way off the shore of um north northwestern um, scotland northeastern scotland um and about the tricks they used to get up to by themselves away from the fishes and the families <laughs> so yeah thanks other questions comments yes there is um so this is a comment from sorry my i haven't got my glasses um, <laughs> Um, so I can't read the name, it's actually too small, but <laughs> hello, <laughs> was any action taken against the New South Wales Police Commissioner for making a nasty comment for non-taxpayer persons to go home? Uh, could you say that again? Yeah, uh, was any action taken against um, the New South Wales Police Commissioner for his comments about, um, about going home, the, the shit? Yeah, well, I mean, no, because it was the middle of the... Um, uh, crisis but also let's be clear i mean the, as i briefly mentioned the, the business model of cruising is abominable um and no they don't pay these you know carnival and piano they pay hardly anything to come in um you know they um you know the whole model is geared to people going out and having a coffee but coming back to the ship to have you know dinner so they do diddly squat in the in Australia, and even worse, um, in the the countries of the global south that first were, um, you know, inundated with this form. Uh, why am I looking at Liz? Uh, <laughs> sorry, Liz. I'm looking at Kane. I should be looking. <laughs> sorry. Who is it? Who is it? Please. Question. I actually can't see. See it, yeah. Well, thank you. And yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, tourism doesn't get studied much in cultural studies. Um, and, and then it often gets shunted as if it's not the, the subject for uh, grand sandstone places like here. Um, but there is still so much to do about um, the different forms of tourism. Um, yeah, so. I've got a question. Okay. Very quick one. Well, it's actually not very quick, but, <laughs> but um, I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, the move from experience as a sort of basis for thinking and um, to your sort of work in sort of embodied ethnography um, and what that allows that is, is different or similar to experience. And then what you're doing in this paper, which seems to be using the ocean as this um, sort of, you know, uh, dense site but also a sort of figurative way of making connections between sort of disparate mm. um you know situations that we normally think of as quite distinct so yeah thanks again i mean um it is it seems like a long time ago um with, from when you read that quote out from sex in the self which was my uh phd thesis um and I suppose the kind of oh, maybe it was the optimism and euphoria of the time, you know, 
um, we really thought that these different theories mattered so much. And don't forget, I was in Montreal, so we were grappling with postmodern and post-structural things in French before the Americans took it up. Um, but so for me, that first move to understand experience um, came from um, a very, you know, wanting a touchstone. I mean, Hall, Stuart Hall puts it, you know, to feel on your pulse the worldliness um, and to have some sense of how things connect and moving away from that being perhaps solipsistic to looking at it in terms of the, the dialogic um, ethnography, which I tr try and do through, you know, people relate stories to me. I mean, I love talking to people all the time anyway. Um, and then I relate them to different theoretical or whatever, to then this where, I mean, I can't, you know. Um, I mean, Don Yang, I've said, why well, Don Yang? I've said, you or it can go on a cargo ship and do ethnography. 63 year old cut. Um, but um, yeah, so it's just trying to, to think about again um, those connections. And it does go back a lot to um, Innis. I mean, people get sick of Innis, but well, not here because they never hear him. But you know, in Canada, you know, the train the Canadian National Pacific, no, Canadian National Railway that went from one end to the other, that was the means of keeping an identity of Canada as distinct from what it should have been, which was North-South. Um, and so the, those political economic forms of connection um, are so important. And yeah, I just, I get a thrill out of cargo ships. <laughs> Well, thank you for a thrilling presentation and thanks everybody for coming along.